With me right now is Kevin Roberts, Heritage Foundation president. And Kevin, we'll talk about politics. But first things first, in Florida, so many people relocated there from the Northeast, especially New York. This is maybe their first hurricane. It, it is. And, you know, I grew up on the Gulf Coast in Louisiana, Brian. Watching this coverage reminds me of Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which was a direct hit on my hometown. And and obviously living through that, that day of those winds and that devastation is awful. But as you and I were talking about a couple minutes ago, the real test for everybody will come the next few days and weeks. And so for people who've recently relocated there, what a rude awakening to what life is like on the coast. I mean, we thought it was going to hit in Tampa. It hit in Fort Myers. Uh, they seem to be a, so much surprised by it. And then the sheriff came out and, you know, I was talking, texting with Marco Rubio. He says he's a great guy, but he says, uh, we know there's hundreds dead and he has no confirmation on that. But I did hear from somebody off the record there, they've seen bodies. So there is going to be some fatalities. But to say hundreds, if that's not true, that's strange for him to say that. Look, there's you and I both know there's no way that he knows that. I'm not going to sit here and, and question his motive, but he's got to be more responsible about that because – Unfortunately, Brian, there's little doubt that there will be fatalities. Obviously, we hope for our fellow Americans those are those are minimal. Between the human toll of this and the, the toll of having 10, 20 feet of, of storm surge in your homes, this is going to be a major recovery effort, especially when you consider that part of Florida and that very well-run, booming state is, is like the engine of the state. Right. I mean, you got 7,000 National Guard been mobilized already, 40,000 emergency workers ready to go. And we have equipment staged uh, in various areas. Ron DeSantis has been very cool under pressure. That's how he's characterized. I talked to Jared Kushner and uh, about what, his time in the pandemic. And we were talking and he said, I said, who are you in the most communication with? He said, like clockwork, uh, Governor DeSantis would call me every day and he'd crunch numbers. He'd have opinions. He asked me if this was right or this was wrong. And that's the type of that's somebody that's got the military background, the Yale uh, and Harvard degrees and somebody that wants to pull this off. So far, so good. So far, so good. He's And I have a lot of scrutiny of that from a policy point of view. And growing up on the Gulf Coast, you think about what happened in Louisiana with, with Governor Blanco at that point. But DeSantis thus far gets near perfect marks. I mean, he prepared the state well. I don't mean that as a political statement. We ought not be thinking about politics as Americans, although, of course, the Biden administration wants to. I think he's going to do really well because he's got the leadership profile to communicate well, to make really good decisions. And when he needs to push the feds to to act quicker, we know that he's willing to do it. And he'll go to the microphone and say when he's not getting it. I remember, and I brought this up to Rick Scott when he was Governor Scott, but just now a senator on Fox and Friends. And after that, uh, the, after that club shooting uh, in Orlando, he said, I have not heard from President Obama. And, he, and President Obama was coming into town and never called the Republican governor. And yet he was already in his second term. Yet be a leader. And he said, so far, President Biden, after waiting a few days— Came out and he called and he even called again this morning. He says, yeah, I'm glad you called because we have a few more counties that are under duress. I'd like you to declare them emergencies, which allows individuals to go up and say, I've lost my house. I have no spending money. I need some clothes. I need a place to go. So that allows individuals to go up to FEMA. It, it's crucial. And, and if President Biden, in fact, is going to be the uniter that he promised to be in the last election, he, this is the opportunity for him to show it. Obviously, DeSantis, you and I were just watching his press conference, has done a really good job of just being focused on helping his people. It's really crucial for all of us to understand that the scope of this particular natural disaster is going to last not for weeks, but for months and probably a couple of years. This is when you can shorten that recovery. Right. Uh, yeah. How quick to get the power back on, how quick you get people food and be responsive. That will ultimately be his grade. So I was shocked about a few things. And we know a major gaffe by the president yesterday is everyone concerned. How about this? What about this choice to say this at this time? Cut nine. So forgive me, I want to add one more warning. That's warning to the oil and gas industry executives. Do not. Let me repeat. Do not. Do not use this as an excuse to raise gasoline prices or gouge the American people. Again, he's vilifying oil and gas companies. Is he's not? If he's not trying to destroy them, he is ripping them, blaming them for high gas prices. It's just juvenile pandering, Brian. In fact, it, it, it really angers me because you need every kind of business owner to really dig deep and help people. And that's what Americans do. And so this is clearly something Biden sees as a political opportunity. And I want to be really clear, if anyone's gouging the American people, it's Biden and his administration and his allies in Congress who keep – 
in effect, raising taxes by passing more spending that leads directly to inflation. And we'll let refineries open, which will bring the, we'll bring the oil and gas down. So when the oil industry has responded, quote, it's an unfolding weather event. Our industry is focused on keeping the energy market well supplied and delivering fuels when they need it, most while ensuring the safety of our workforce. Gasoline prices are determined by market forces, not individual companies. And claims that the price of the pump is anything but a function of supply and demand are false. So he doesn't even know what he's talking about. Well, we already know that, right? Because if he had even an eighth grade understanding of economics, he wouldn't be pushing for all of the legislation that's happened in his administration. He was telling people why if the barrel of oil is $76, has prices of gas gone up for the last five or six days? But he says right away it's get, it's those horrible gas station owners because we know how rich they are. And it's these horrible oil executives. And, and, and interestingly, as, as we know – to your point, most gas station o- owners are small businesses. They own one location. They are scraping by, especially during a period of inflation. We shouldn't be vilifying these people. We should be actually celebrating what they're doing for the American economy. Uh, especially while uh, Western Europe pines for some type of oil and gas relief and good allies would provide that and we can. So I want you to hear what the president said yesterday in a, a lightly covered event about nutrition he was uh, looking for somebody who played a role in putting together this conference, Jackie Walorski, who sadly, tragically died in a car accident about a month ago. Listen to this. Cut 17. And I want to thank all of you here, for in- including bipartisan elected officials like Representative Governor, Senator Braun, Senator Booker, Representative Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? I didn't think she was, she was going to be here. Okay. You know why she's not there? Uh, because she's dead. Uh, and I don't know who put that in this copy or what he was reading, what he was thinking. Kevin, what are your thoughts on this? And by the way, the pool report didn't have this major gaffe in it. I think it's one of the worst examples in a litany of leftist media bias, Brian, which you live through every day. President Biden and my dad are exactly the same age. And I tell my dad, who's a great conservative, Dad, if you ever exhibited signs of that kind of decline mentally, I would drive to where you are And I would bring you to be checked out. And I would do that because of love for you. So that when I see this president with whom I disagree on everything do that, I'm sad for this country. But it also scares the daylights out of me, Brian, as someone with four kids and who loves this country, that there's no way he's capable of making decisions. And you think about what's confronting the United States, not just domestically, but in terms of foreign policy with the Chinese Communist Party, with with Putin, there is no way that he's the one making decisions. It really ought to concern all of us, including his party. Or he thinks he's making decisions. For example, when he came out with the one China policy and they walked him back for the fourth time. It's unbelievable. And they said, well, the president has not changed at all and we have not changed our mission. But they never answered the question, nor are they pressed. Can you imagine if President Trump came out and tried to salute somebody that was dead? I mean, there's no way. And, they and, wouldn't even cover the hurricane on CNN. They no. would cover just his gaffe. And and you and I are both old enough to remember when the the media in the late eighties would make fun of President Reagan. Always. And and there was no substance there, at least at that point in his life. The point is it raises the question, who's actually running the country? That's an equally scary question. So listen to this. The least skilled press secretary in the history of our nation is now in charge. So this happens, and it's the Washington Post who asked the question. Karine Jean Pierre, listen to this. Now I know she's in a tough spot in defense of her. What do you do when you know something this cataclysmic has happened? There are no fatalities in this, but what does it lead you to believe? Cut 18. If the late Congresswoman was top of mind for the president and her family was expected to be here and that's what he was thinking about, what, why was he looking for? I'm not, I'm not trying to be snarky here. But no, I mean, and I'm... No, what you were saying and what he said there. And again, I think people can understand. I think the American people out there who, you know, watch the briefing... Uh, from time to time, maybe at this moment, will understand when someone is at top of mind, uh, and uh, and this was such an important, uh, such an important event when we're talking about hunger, when we're talking about food insecurity, when we're talking about these champions, these congressional champions who were in the room, who have worked in a bipartisan way. Uh, we know we don't talk much about bipartisan actions that we see in Congress at this okay, time. Okay, it's pathetic, terrible spin. Um, here's more. So they didn't let up. And this wasn't Peter Ducey and it wasn't Fox. Cut 20. Would you be prepared to release the prepared remarks that the president had in teleprompter just so we could understand? Uh, I'm not understanding why why that would be, would be necessary. We always share uh, the remarks that the president uh, had, um, uh, even, you know, delivered. That's probably going to be up on the website. Uh, 
not really sure what that has to do with anything. I just answered the question about her being on top of mind. I don't think that's any that's unusual. I feel like many of us have gone through uh, that particular uh, you know time where someone is on top of mind and you call them out. No. She's a specialist in using a lot of words and saying nothing. And and I think if I may make a prediction here, Brian, what's going to happen is the president's party is going to take it in the chin for midterms, and then his own party is going to turn against him. And to your point, the reporters asking those questions are not strident conservatives, right? These are people probably left of center who are, are concerned, and I think that's going to grow. And it, it leads me to believe 2023 is going to be already a very interesting year, even more so if the left abandons Biden. I know what's worse. He called the husband and they put the White House flag at half mass. And the husband says, you know, it's forgivable. But who? You know, he's not mad. Was, it, was he going to be mad at him? Of course, he's, it's, it's not as if he disparaged her. But it's, I'm concerned for – back to your original point. I'm, I'm concerned for the country. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Uh, I, I mean – yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I don't it, know what to say. It's a big deal, right? And and I don't think the president intended to do it. That's sort of the point. I'm sure the the, the widower of the congressman was was gracious. But the point is, compare that to the decisions that need to be made about Taiwan, about the Chinese Communist Party, about Ukraine and Russia. There's no way Joe Biden is capable of making this. All right. When we come back, uh, we'll have a few more minutes with uh, Kevin Roberts. Uh, he's Heritage Foundation president for the last year. How's it been going? Uh, what does he expect? Uh, leading up to 2022 and right after. You're listening to The Brian Kilmeade Show. Don't move. He's so busy, he'll make your head spin. It's Brian Kilmeade. In every election, every year, this year, past years, it's great to have terrific candidates. We're in a bunch of close races. I think we have a 50-50 shot of getting the Senate back. It's going to be really, really close either way, in my view. So Mitch McConnell, a lot different now, uh, and I think people got to him. Also, I think there's Kevin Roberts. I think there's some legitimate optimism here. Uh, let's let's break it down, if I can. Put I know who you want to win, but Dom Bullock, Governor Sununu, and he sparred. The minute he gets the nomination, he goes, I'm all for the general. So what do you think his chances are, being that he never got the Trump uh, treatment, he never was got the anointment from Trump, and now he's backing off saying that the election was fixed? I think I take a step back from that because I, I want the conservatives to win so that good policy is passed. I see in the last two weeks a shift back toward the conservative candidates, Brian. And I think in New Hampshire, as you're talking about, in Ohio, I think even in Arizona, where the Republican nominee, Blake Masters, is is told by the media he has no chance. I actually think we're going to get not just – A few dozen seats in the House. I do think there will be a conservative majority in the Senate. But let me just say, being the president of the largest conservative think tank in the world. By the way, 538 said there's only a 17 percent chance. Yeah, but see, they also said that that Hillary Clinton was going to win on election night in 2016. Leading the largest conservative policy group, we want these men and women to win so that we get conservative policy passed. It's not enough merely to have a Republican majority. It looks like Fetterman, who is the least qualified person to ever run for office, especially after his stroke, he is Bernie Sanders. Sanders in a hoodie, and he does not reflect what I thought Pennsylvania was, whether you're conservative or liberal, you're not that. So he is now taking Black Lives Matter off his website. He's trying to be a law and order guy. Well, you already have him on record saying he wants to release a third of the prisoners. Oz is within four. I understand the Republican Party has not coalesced around him. Is that true? That is true. I do think that there has been movement toward him by the party apparatus in Pennsylvania over the last two weeks. You see, I think the fruit of that is narrowing the uh, the spread. You've also seen something similar in Georgia happen, where I now believe that Herschel Walker is going to defeat the incumbent. Well, have you met Herschel? I haven't met him personally. Um, I, I had a bad chance to spend a couple of days with him, known him in the past, and you don't see a guy studying harder. He wants to be underestimated. The guy's studying like crazy. He's approaching it just like he did in sports and business. So he's not going to be outworked. And we'll see what happens on the debate. He's effectively lowering the bar. Um, and the other, the other big story is the president of the United States got a super PAC with $100 million. He helped get Mastriano in there, get Oz in there, get Blake Masters in there. Uh, that's just uh, J.D. Vance. Is the pre- Did you ask the president to start spending money for these candidates? 
You know, I I wish I had that kind of influence, but we do joke about this at Heritage because while we don't make endorsements, these are our kind of guys. And what I mean by that is they are conservatives. They want to go to Washington, D.C. or their state capital for the gubernatorial candidates. And what do they want to do, Brian? They want to restore self-governance to the American people. Sign up the Heritage Foundation for anyone who wants to do that because the clock is ticking in order to take this republic back. Right, and we'll see if it's going to happen. Uh, Kevin Roberts at the helm, uh, the Heritage Foundation president. You can follow him at Kevin Roberts TX Texas, right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Kevin. Great to see you. Thanks for having Best me. Best luck in the next five weeks. It's going to be exciting. We'll have you on again. When we come back, we're going to be stuck with Carly Shimkus. See if she has anything to say.